There have been people living around Kill since the Stone Age. We know this from objects such as the Kilwarden Stone, which was found just north of the village in the 1980s. This stone contains decoration such as the spiral carvings on the stones at Newgrange, which have been dated to at least 5,000 years ago. The Kilwarden Stone is currently in the National Museum of Ireland, where it takes pride of place on the ground floor. Above the village, on the top of Kill Hill, is a vast Bronze Age hill fort, which still can be traced in the field boundaries there. Archaeologists investigating in advance of the widening of the N7 northbound some years ago found several Bronze Age burial urns as well as traces of Iron Age settlement. The village itself takes its name from the Irish word keel, which means church, and so we can be sure that there's been a church of some sort here in Kill since early Christian times. So where better to begin our tour of Kill than outside the St. John's Church of Ireland in the middle of the village? The present church is probably built on the site of the first church in Kill, which was taken over or rebuilt when the Normans came to Kildare in the 12th century. The church has many interesting features, including its unusual half doors and its organ dating from the 1700s, which has its black and white keys reversed. A stone font now outside the door probably belonged to an earlier church on the site. Behind the church and at the back of the Glendara housing estate is the moat of Kill. This is probably the site on which the Norman de Hereford family, who were granted the lands around Kill, erected their first fortifications. This may, however, also be a much earlier burial mound, and I should also mention there is a strong tradition in Kill that several of the kings of Leinster are buried there. The names of nine of these chieftains are mentioned in the ancient annals, where it is said they're buried at Kilcorban. Heading southward from the church, we pass some new houses which were built on the site of what was probably the location of the village green in the Middle Ages. We then come to a single-storey building which used to be the site of the guard station. This was originally an RIC station and would have been the base from which an RIC patrol set out in August 1920 to travel to Naas but were ambushed at Green Hills, where two of them were shot. This happened during the War of Independence, and the station was later burned down. However, it was subsequently rebuilt and used as a guard station until its much lamented closure in the last few years. We will now cross over to the Dewdrop Inn. This is sometimes known as Lady Mayo's Inn, and was supposed to have been modelled on a similar inn somewhere in England. Early photographs show that it had tea rooms at one side of the building. Returning northwards along the main street, we pass a high wall on the left, behind which is a house which was originally a school. It began as an Erasmus Smith school, The original Erasmus Smith was a cavalry commander in Cromwell's army who, later in life, regretted the violence he'd been involved in. To make amends, he left a large sum of money in his will to set up schools for the education of poor boys and girls. In 1824, there were 24 boys and 26 girls attending this school, of whom 30 were Catholic and 20 were Protestant. At the side of this building is a lane which used to be known as Ard's Lane. Mr. Ard was apparently the teacher in the school. He is supposed to have been the first man to own a penny-farthing bicycle in the village. On the other side of the lane is a large building which was known as the dispensary. 
the local doctor and nurse operated from there and served the medical needs of the locality from the 19th century up to the late 1980s. The site is now vacant. Further along, we come to the Old House pub. This pub has a long history going back to the 18th century. It would originally have been a single-story building with a thatched roof. It was raided and ransacked by the Black and Tans, and a number of local people were assaulted in retaliation for the shooting of the RIC men in 1920. The sign outside the pub today says that it was built in 1794 and rebuilt in 1943. The rebuild took place after a disastrous fire and the pub was set back from the street line at that stage. Beside this is another lane which originally led to Straffan before the building of the Nace Jewel Carriageway. There was a forge down this road and the river nearby was used to cool the iron hoops of the cartwheels before they were hammered into shape on a shoeing stone which stood on the banks of the river. There is a story that in the 19th century, the Empress of Austria, who often stayed and hunted in the locality, lost a shoe from her horse after a jump and had a new one put on at the forge. There's also a story that on that one occasion, she brought two local boys with her to Vienna, where they got positions in her court. Many years later, they came back to kill, but found great difficulty in communicating with local people, because at that stage, they only spoke German. Next on the left is the People's Park, which is the site of the old parochial house in Kill. Beside it is the Catholic Church of St. Bridget, which was built in 1821 and is celebrating its bicentenary this year. It was built seven years before Catholic emancipation and during the pastorate of Father Daniel Nolan. The church is mentioned in the memoirs of the famous Fenian John Devoy, who was born in Kill in 1842 and whom Padraig Pierce described as the greatest of the Fenians. The church was extended and remodeled in the 70s to deal with the rapid increase in the population of Kill at that time and has served the spiritual needs of the parish well over the past two centuries. Next to the church is the old National School building with its quaint Gothic windows. This school was built in the 1830s and served the educational needs of the parish until the 50s when a new school was built. Next to that was the schoolmaster's house. One of the most famous of our schoolmasters was Limo Flynn a well-known Gaelgeor and collector of folklore and traditional music. His son, Lee Moog, became even more famous as a member of the well-known folk group Planksty and ultimately as Ireland's foremost Illan Piper. We've had many other famous people in Kill over the years. For example, after the Second World War, Ernest Lyons from Hartwell won the famous Isle of Man TT trophy on a motorbike which he built himself. In the 1960s, a young boxer from Kill, Colin McCoy, represented Ireland at the Olympic Games and probably would have won a medal had he not come up against an even more talented young boxer from the US called Cassius Clay, later Muhammad Ali. Also, in the 1960s, we had Pat Taff here, who became world famous as the jockey on the invincible racehorse Arkle. While in recent years, the tradition has continued with the talented Walsh family, Ted, Ruby, and of course Katie, one of the groundbreaking new breed of women jockeys. No kill person will ever forget 
the millennium year of 2000 and the fantastic homecoming with the Walsh family when the wonderful Papillon won the Grand National entry with Ted as the trainer and Ruby as the jockey. What a day that was for Kill. <laughs> 